See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. Hey, See You Now fans. It's your host, Shauna Butler. As part of celebrating Women's History Month, we're listening to, learning from, and elevating the trailblazers of today and asking what the preferred experience of health and design of health systems looks like when we center on the women in nursing who lead the way. A recent and disturbing report from the Centers for Disease Control on maternal mortality rates for 2020 prompted us to return to one of our very first and timeless episodes, Empowering Childbirth, and the story of nurse midwife and maternal and child health pioneer, innovator, and activist, Ruth Lubick. According to the CDC's report, in 2020, during the first year of the pandemic, the number of women in the United States who died during pregnancy or shortly after giving birth increased sharply, an increase that health officials attribute partly to COVID and the disruptions the pandemic created in accessing care. U.S. maternal death, near death, and injury is the highest in the developed world. And the trend, despite our awareness, continues to worsen. Women in the U.S. have long suffered an unconscionable maternal mortality crisis, and no one should have to fear for their life when giving birth. Yet, in the U.S., hundreds of women disproportionately black women die each year due to maternal causes, and many of these deaths are preventable. So in an effort to support and amplify the legislative and public health effort that Ruth has been leading for the past six decades, during National Women's History Month, let's revisit, renew, and fortify our efforts on a better future for and history for maternal and child health. Enjoy. This is See You Now. When we think about and talk about innovation, we might picture technological advances, scientific breakthroughs, and exciting new devices. But the Latin origins of the term innovatus remind us that to innovate also means to renew and to restore. When it comes to childbirthing in the U.S., renewing a commitment to safety and security for everyone is an innovation that can help restore confidence in a nation that is swiftly becoming one of the scariest places to be pregnant and give birth. The U.S. currently has the highest maternal mortality rate out of all of the countries in the developed world. And since the year 2000, maternal mortality rates have seen a disturbingly steady increase. And the U.S. stands alone and stands out as the only developed country experiencing an increase. The focus on maternal and infant health in the U.S. is paramount where, according to a March of Dimes report, over 5 million women are living in maternity care deserts with no nearby hospitals offering maternity care services. These are just a few reasons this episode with maternal care pioneer Ruth Lubick is so significant. As the saying goes, never let a good crisis go to waste. And in a career that has spanned over six decades, Ruth has taken every opportunity to do the big things that no one thought possible and made them possible. She has received numerous honors for her innovations and enduring dedication to better birth experiences and outcomes. We talk with Ruth about what she witnessed early in her career that shaped her drive to improve maternity care and serve families. When women would go in to the hospital labor and delivery suite, were birth. First of all, family was not included, so they were going in alone. Secondly, they were given Demerol and scopolamine in most instances. Thirdly, they would be tied into the labor bed. 
because they'd had enough Demerol and scopolamine that, that they were not compass mentis. In 1975, in New York City, Ruth set up the first legally sanctioned freestanding birth center in the U.S., a non-hospital setting where women could go to give birth. In 1993, Ruth was the first nurse to be named as a MacArthur Fellow and sought to help those suffering the most due to high infant mortality rates. She used her grant to found the D.C. Developing Family Centers. We caught up with her in Washington, D.C., where she and her husband, Bill, connected with us from the NPR studios. Okay, I just need to be very honest with you, Ruth. I'm hyperventilating having fangirl um, phenomenon at the moment. Oh, goodness. (laughs) Yes, it has been um, a hope to have an opportunity to talk with you, have a conversation with you. And I, I know that there are many people who express their appreciation and admiration. And I just want to add to that very loud oh, choir and chorus. You. Thank you, Shauna. Yeah, I'm, um, I started my career in Washington, D.C., in the very places that you have chosen to serve. A lot of my training was spent in Anacostia, and many of the neighborhoods at that point in time that were known as the crime capital of the world. Mm -hmm. And what I came to know was a group of um, wonderful families with strong and rich identities who were um, really struggling against a a system that did not acknowledge them, did not support, did not serve them. And when I learned about your work up in New York— and some degree of following your career was a little bit hard before the internet. <laughs> um, but after the MacArthur Fellowship, mm-hmm. it became a lot easier. And it was one of my questions very early in my career is if, if the MacArthur Foundation is looking for those who can um, make a more just and verdant world, they would certainly be awarding many more fellowships to nurses. So I was very excited to see that you yes, open well, I, open I, their I, minds to that. I was the first one. Exactly. I, yes, I was surprised. And you know the the pen is is collecting my papers and things and I, they're going to be Yeah, I do. I saw yes, that there yes. there's a nice collection of all of that. And I think what would what I'd love for you to share because you have a unique um depth and breadth of the changes and the challenges that have happened within maternal infant care. Mm-hmm. And I would love it if you could share you know, your, your history, because when we think about so many of the changes and the improvements and the advancements and, and in some ways deteriorations um, of what it has been like to be pregnant and um, or pregnancy intention, that's, an, that's a whole other part mm-hmm. of this. Mm-hmm. And then where we go to get care, who is part of that care, where that care is delivered, there have been dramatic changes. And I would love to hear your sharing of that unfolding and changing and where some of those influences have been from. Well, you know, we opened the first birth center in 75. And by the early 80s, there were midwives from all over the country coming to us saying that they wanted to do a birth center. They they would come to look at us, and then they would decide that, yes, this was what was needed wherever they were. And they were from all over the country. And so we tried to uh, help them take advantage of the what we had learned, you know, because part of it is getting uh, the the legal permission to do it. Part of it is the money, you know, and so forth and so on. So... Uh, that that's what we worked on uh very hard and formed and then set up the uh, American Association of Birth Centers and uh and that's been doing workshops in how to establish freestanding birth centers for a number of years now and they're they're very complete they they go into everything you know from the uh from the, the the space that you need and and the the staff that you need and the funding that you need and so forth and so on. 
And when we opened, we were the first freestanding birth center in the country that was that was legally sanctioned, you know, mm -hmm. and because there had been people in the field who had tried to uh, give a, a different kind of birth to families they were caring for, but it wasn't done in the same way that we were doing it. And uh, so it's, it continues to grow. Uh, and by continuing to grow, I mean, we were the first legally sanctioned center in 1975, and now there are more than than 350 birth centers operating in this country. There has been a, a study by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation called the Strong Start Study, which looked at birth center care, the maternity home care, and the um, the centering pregnancy. Oh yes, yes. Um, um, so those three things mm -hmm. were looked at in the in the Strong Start Study, and there have been. Materials come out of the federal government suggesting that the uh, that there should be more birth centers available, especially to very low income families. That it that it does improve outcomes and so forth. Now, well, spe there, yeah, speaking of the outcomes, I've I've heard you testify to many sessions of Congress and giving uh, data that is so impressive as far as birth outcomes, safe births, and being able to do so at much lower costs. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, is the, what is the difference? What, what is it that you're doing in the birth centers that is producing so much better outcomes at, um, at much better value? Well, I, th I think the thing that we do is consider the families to be part of our team. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they have their responsibilities, you know, to learn about what's going on, and we make the information available to them. And when they come for uh, sessions, uh, for uh, at, at, for prenatal sessions, they're usually group sessions, and and uh, and we just encourage them, and uh, and then they have a chance to talk to other families who have utilized the birth center and find out what they feel about their experience. And and it's, you know, if I wanted to stop it, uh, I don't think I could do it. <laughs> That's a, a, a Yeah, you started a movement that you can't even stop. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking about what women in your generation when they were giving birth, what their options were, but more when when birthing became highly medicalized. Can you describe what that... Um, birth experience was like for, for the moms and for the families? Well, it, it was not a family experience. It was a medical experience. But it was a, a way of taking the whole experience away from the family. And even when we, you know, we did the first birth center on um, 94, 92nd Street between Madison Park and New York, which is a, a high-rent area, and uh, the families who came to us there came easily, enjoyed their experience and so forth, but we did not see the very low-income families that my intuition told me we should be trying to help and that uh, we could really make a big difference in their whole lives by giving them a good birth experience. And and so um, we... we uh, looked for another place to have uh, a birth center in a neighborhood where there were mostly people of uh, color and people of low income. And we finally found a place in the South Bronx in New York, and that was opened in 1988. And it was there that, I, I, Shona, I cannot ever adequately emphasize with you the way I did not see the empowerment factor when we went there. I knew that we could make outcomes better. That was never a question in my mind. But this whole idea of empowerment, it, it just, it was never in my vision at all. And uh, But it was put in my vision by a young African-American woman because we made a point of telling the families the, the difference between 
obstetrics where it's generally uh, described as doctors delivering babies. And uh, between that and the way we saw it being done, which is we attend women while they give birth. And this young woman, when she was asked what she thought about the care that was given, she said, you know, if you've given birth, then you've given life. And if you've given life, you can do anything. You can get a job, and you can go to school, and you can do whatever you want as long as you put your mind to it. And she said, I think that's the best thing about the center. It empowers women. And the women, in in turn, empower their families. And the families can empower their community. And you know, Shauna, what what I saw when she said all those things? I saw, we have the answer to this problem of low-income areas where people get mired in nothing, you know, and... That young woman was instrumental in my career. She helped you to see something that was right there, and and you didn't maybe have the words or the vocabulary for it? Yeah. The way way she said it was really a sort of an eye-opener to me. And some years later, when I was at at a meeting of medical people, and I was asked to speak about... uh, just give an example, you know, of, of what we were doing. And I repeated that when that she said, you know, and, and uh, you could have heard a pin drop in the place. It was just, and then people came up to me afterward and said, you know, that's, it's really inspirational to hear you say that. I said, okay, let's do more. <laughs> I like that. Let's let's do more. <laughs> the, when she's dis- this young woman is describing the difference in the experience, what at the time when you were first opening these birthing centers, um, what was the experience for families in a hospital setting in a medical model? Well, you know, if I can move it from the birth itself to the the original visit to a setting for uh, prenatal care, and one of the one of the women described it very well in that uh, you go in and you're asked what your name is and you're told to sit down over there and then you're called over and you're given a card to bring this with you when you come. And you you don't know anything about what the care will be, when it will start, how what is your role in it, and, uh, and, and it, it's just very denigrating. You know, so... It begins that way, and it goes on that way because when when women would go in to the hospital labor and delivery suite for birth, first of all, family was not included, so they were going in alone. Secondly, they they were given Demerol and Scopolamine in most instances, um, the Demerol to relieve pain and the Scopolamine so that they would not remember. But thirdly. They would be tied into the labor bed because they'd had enough Demerol and Scopolamine that that they were not compass mentis. Mm -hmm. And so they would be tied into the bed because they might throw themselves out of the bed or hurt hurt the fetus or something like that. And they labored that way until they were found to be, you know, sufficiently dilated to go to the uh, delivery room. And when they got to the delivery room, again... On the table, they would be strapped on with great leather cuffs that they could not possibly have gotten out of. So that, And the whole idea was that we don't want them to get off the table to hurt themselves, you know, and so forth. I remember going down to the labor and delivery room with a woman who had had a prior birth experience. And when she got down there, it was too late for her to have the additional general anesthesia, which was usually given in the delivery room on top of what else had been had happened uh, earlier in the labor. But when she got down there, she was ready to give birth. So they caught the baby, and she pushed herself up as much as she could on the table, and she said, I want to hold my baby. And she was told, you can't hold your baby. You're dirty, and your baby is clean. 
Say that again? She was told, you're dirty? You're dirty, and your baby is clean. And the, and the, at the time, you know, the, the baby would be over uh, being worked on by the, the nurses and the pediatricians if, if necessary. But I just, I, I really I couldn't believe my ears, you know. And yet I was not in a position as a, really a student nurse I was that, that to really make a fuss about that, although I felt like I, I should be. So that is so radically different than what our practice and our understanding is right now with mm-hmm. skin to skin, the mm-hmm. warmth of the baby, keeping the baby right. warm for thermoregulatory um, processes, for bonding, for mm-hmm. mother's sense of well-being, for there are just so many layers of uh, benefits. Benefits, yeah. thank you. Yes. Yeah, benefits. Yeah. What we know for, for mom and baby immediately after, that, first of all, that just sounds horrific. No wonder so many women... <laughs> Yeah. We're, we're frightened, reasonably so. Um, given that treatment model and that medicalization, how were women meant to support the natural contractions in being able to birth their babies if they weren't fully aware and conscious? Well, they weren't uh, really expected, in my memory, they weren't really expected to be a part of giving birth. They were just uh, to remain there, do as they're told, and uh, we'll take care of it. You know, we'll get your baby out. You're listening to See You Now. I'm Shauna Butler. We're talking with pioneering nurse, midwife, and MacArthur Fellow, Ruth Lubick. Ruth, I'm curious, how does somebody affect change? How does somebody take a bold idea to the market or to policy or to communities and affect change? Yeah. You know, Shona, I, I would take that all the way back to my precedents. And the one that is most famous probably of all, because I was general director of an organization called Maternity Center Association, which was established in 1917, but its first director was Frances Perkins. And mm, uh, Frances Perkins, the U.S. Secretary of Labor under FDR. Wow. You know, it it all fits together when you look at it over the long haul. She She was just director for a couple of years, but they had been involved in setting up nursing stations in uh, East Harlem and Central Harlem where there was no care available. But I have to say, too, that um, while nurses did not appear maybe as as they should have or be given the credit they should have, we would not have been able to do what we did if we did not have individual doctor friends. And one of the the greatest friends we had was... uh, Bernard Pisani, who was the chair of the Department of OBGYN at St. Vincent's, and he also later became the president of the New York Academy of Medicine. And when I was called to the New York Academy of Medicine by uh, a group of obstetricians who were who were operating in the in the larger teaching hospitals, it was very interesting because that we sat in a big conference room and they had said, we want to talk to you. I said, I would appreciate that greatly, you know, because we were just getting the freestanding birth center started. So we went round this table and each one of them told negative stories about what happened if you're not in a hospital and giving birth, you know. So when we got to uh, Barney, as everybody called him, Uh, He was a a soft-spoken man, a very intense um, Catholic, really believer in in, uh, support of families. But his father had been a a general practitioner in the Lower East Side, and he and his brothers would go out with him when he was called out to do birth because the women who lived in those tenements could not get into hospitals. They didn't have money. So he went into their homes, and the, and they gave birth there. But Barney had been lucky enough to have the experience of see how important this was socially and to the families and so forth. 
And he said to this group, and mind you, he was the president of the New York Academy of Medicine at the time, and this was in the in the mid seventies, like. And uh, when when um, it came to his turn to speak, and he was the last to speak, he told them about his father and how he had helped his father going into tenements and and uh, helping women give birth in tenements. And uh, he said, I think they deserve a chance. And, the, and so the whole thing turned over in my direction, where it had not been in my direction uh, for quite a bit of time in, in the beginning of that conversation. So um, I just wanted to make the point that while organized medicine may have a great number of doubts about what nurses can do, there are individual physicians there who in the, in the world who help you. And I can name a number who who were important uh, people in my career. And Barney was just... He was one of them, but there were others too. So it, it's it's an interesting um, it's an interesting problem, if you will. But I think it proves the fact that we all need to work together. You make a very important distinction between organized medicine, organized mm-hmm. healthcare, and individual practitioners mm-hmm. and professionals. Mm-hmm. And you have many examples of where collaboration and partnership has been fundamental and vital and critical to making progress. And I, most of the innovators, regardless of their training or preparation or the role that they hold, those who have been successful speak very much to that need mm-hmm. in order to move um, mm-hmm. an idea or a new way of doing into, yes. into impact. It, it does happen by having key partners. You know, Shauna, when you get a MacArthur, there are a lot of doors that open for you. And one of the doors that had opened for me in 1993 was an invitation to travel with a professional group, mostly pediatricians, to France to look at what the French call their system, protection maternelle et infantile, not aid to and assistance for, but protection of mothers and babies. And I had really been uh, affected by that. You know, I saw all the things that the, the French did. They had uh, peripatrices wh- who who went out and did visits after the the birth of the child and so forth. And and all I could think of, really, to tell you the truth, is, is the problems that my husband, who is sitting here with me, and I had raising our son... Um, by ourselves, so to speak. We had a wonderful, wonderful uh, obstetrician who gave us an hour of time to spend with him when he was born uh, in hospital. And uh, he, uh, but the the whole movement toward families staying together and being together, I saw a lot of in my trip to France. And, and so... And I actually uh, became friendly with some of the uh, French American Foundation people, and uh, and they they were uh, really interested in what we were doing too. So you mentioned receiving the MacArthur Fellowship. What change did that make for you? And what circles of influence <coughs> and ideas and expectations and opportunities did that award open up for you? Well, I guess what it did f- primarily was open up my eyes <laughs> to 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 the fact that people thought that what the it, the nurse midwives in the country were doing was had a had a certain benefit that needed to be rewarded. Now, the thing about the MacArthur is that you cannot apply for it and uh, it just happens to you or it doesn't. <laughs> and it did happen to me now. It was a real uh, what can I say? Blessing, I guess, is the the best word for me, and it made me feel uh, that there was a, a road down which I should continue going, and that that there might be for the the families that we served, there might be a, a reward. Now, what what it did for me was make me want to work with the country's worst outcomes, which you know, Shauna, mm-hmm. are here. Yeah. In the in the district, and uh, and so uh, 
uh, Bill was very uh, open to my, uh, us moving down, or at least my coming down here, to see what there was that I might be able to do. And it did take, um, see, I got the MacArthur in 93, and then I started coming down on a regular basis in 94, and finally decided I'd better rent an apartment and so forth, and he was very uh, collaborative with that idea. And uh, and so uh, that enabled me to, to work to find a place to put a birth center. But having the, the, the funding, which I think in those days it was $375,000 that you were given as, an, as a MacArthur awardee, and then uh, to have that funding enabled me to do that. And things went along, you know. I, I can't help but notice many of the similarities between your work and your life and your career and that of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Oh, yes. There's so many interesting parallels. Um, and I've only been able to find one picture with the two of you together. Mm-hmm. I'm mm-hmm. I'm curious in your career and your pathways because they do have very um, similar paths, and, and and this point when you were making that when when we show women of um, of, of your generation the the nursing that history, I don't think we can. I think it's the elephant in the room when we don't talk about what it was like for women to be in the professions in the fifties and sixties. It was there were limitations. And I think the two Ruths here have done a great deal to change that. Well, you know, you're aware, are you, uh, Shona, that I gave Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, uh, lessons in in uh, participatory childbirth. Her first child was uh, a, a girl person mm-hmm. named Jane. Yeah. And uh, she did not like the experience that she'd had. And she's actually been quoted in the Washington Post Sunday Magazine section when they did an article on us, and then but Marty was uh, he was a, a fellow young lawyer with Bill at, at uh, a, a very important New York firm, so they knew each other very well. And in the summertime, there would be parties for the associates, which is what Bill and and Marty Ginsburg were. They were associates in the firm. And uh, so I met Ruth there, and <laughs> Ruth and I, Ruth and I would sit in a corner and talk about the real world, and uh, we remained good friends uh, after that time. When she was asked by the the uh, interviewer uh, from the Post, you know about what she, what she thought about uh, her experience having had the participatory childbirth methodology taught her. Now I did not go. I was not her midwife, but except in the preparation that a midwife would do. But when she uh, had the baby, she responded that um, she she felt triumphant <laughs> <laughs> after giving birth to James, the second child. And uh, we have remained friends since then. And she she uh, writes me often and tells me. Uh, what a good girl I've been <laughs> doing so much for for families. And, you know, another person on the court who was uh, very close to me was Sonia Sotomayor. Because Sonia was actually on the board of Maternity Center Association for a three-year period. And uh, I, I got in touch with her and invited her to come out and see what we were doing. And uh, she's just, she's a marvelous human being. We haven't discussed as yet, and I don't know when we might do that, but we haven't discussed as yet my introduction into the model of freestanding birth centers, the whole um, utilization of the, of the geography, I guess, of the center to include early childhood development, right? And we do that in uh, at the fourth week of life. The children can be enrolled in, in the uh, in the in the early childhood development and and one of the things that or I, I suppose the thing that I am most interested in now is in redefining the the word perinatal the word perinatal should be uh, 
begun with the uh, conception and go through the period, not not stopping at for the birth period, but just go straight on through to the point where we know that the child's mental capacities are continuing to grow. And that's what uh, that's what we've tried to do at the Developing Families Center. That's a really important distinction to be made, and particularly in the face of something that you've been working on for, for decades, but that is the rate of maternal and infant mortality, which is shockingly and unconscionably high in the U.S. and rising. As we think about nurses being involved with um, social justice and an advocate and an activist, which you have been such a pioneering example. Where do you think your, and maybe you didn't think of it as social activism or social advocacy, where do you credit some of those seeds of looking at inequities and disparities and, and knowing and feeling that you had a perspective and a point of view that was really important to be heard and shared? You know, Shauna, um, I, I haven't mentioned it. I don't often mention it, but my mother's older sister was a graduate also of the University of Pennsylvania Hospital School of Nursing. And uh, I didn't know a lot about what she had done as a student nurse, but when I talked about going into nursing myself, I talked to her, you know, about what was going on. She told me why she went into nursing was uh, completed the course and then left nursing. She graduated in 1914. During that period of time, the nurses were assigned to to uh, particular settings. She was assigned to um, the uh, operating room, and she just hated what she saw. She felt that there must be better ways to give people back control over their bodies than than the way it was being managed or what she saw there. Can so you, she got Did she in, mention what she saw that was so distressing? Well, it is just that there was no opportunity for the person who was having the surgery, you know, to participate in decision making and and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But there was a, a woman whose name I I don't remember right now. Frances something. Anyway, she was um very involved in trying to help people use their bodies better. And my Aunt Alice uh, saw what she was doing and then went, at her suggestion, went to New York to study with uh, Isadora Duncan. Dance. Dance, yeah. Mm -hmm. And control of body, you know, and so forth. So she did that. When the war was over, she left nursing and uh, she went back and studied more fully with Isadora Duncan. And then she came back to, uh, she went back to Philadelphia and she set up a program called the Alice Craft School of Rhythm. And and she taught the, the rhythm qualities of dance to people who were having trouble with, uh, you know, maintaining their balance, uh, using their bodies well. And this is for, it, it well, there were a lot of children that were that were she studied with, but but there also uh, were many adults, and she went on and worked at that for the rest of her life. Uh, but there are still organizations that promote the theory of Isadora Duncan, mm-hmm. and it's not. I mean, it's about dance, but it's not just dance to entertain. It's dance to to improve your body function, you know, and to help you to enjoy your your life and use your body well and so so it really was a, a kind of what would you call that today Shauna well I'm glad you asked I hear that phrase I've left nursing and I don't think nurses ever leave I think they take their discipline and their expertise and their insights with them into new domains and to new areas. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. so they bring that clinical understanding, the physiologic, the psychologic, and the practical 
mm-hmm. to um, a different area. And I, dance is, is that perfect example when we mm-hmm. think about people who have movement disorders. Mm-hmm. And I think in the period of time when your aunt was practicing, how many people had suffered from polio or who had mm. been in oh, exactly. the iron lung? So and so, yeah, yeah, we needed we needed to yeah. help people regain, regain mus- yeah. muscular strength, yeah. movement, yeah. stability. And mm-hmm. I see that right now in so many different therapies where nurses are bringing mindfulness, meditation, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. music, movement, um, a, a range of disciplines into helping children with autism, adults mm-hmm. who have Parkinson's. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do we increase the stability so that people can have independent lives, mm-hmm. that they have greater mobility, greater autonomy, and a certain degree of dignity? Um, when when people don't feel that they can uh, manage their own needs, if they can't reach for a glass of water, if they're not able to move from a chair to standing, they tend to isolate themselves. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. every bit of autonomy we give people allows them to stay much more connected to their communities and to what gives them joy mm-hmm, every day. Mm-hmm. And so, it's rehabilitation, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's mm-hmm. restoration. Um, yes. Sometimes it's optimization. Sometimes it's recovery. But I, when I hear things, when people say, I left nursing, I'm like, no, you didn't. <laughs> You've just mm-hmm. taken it with you to yes, a yes. new application in another domain. Yes. When you look out the near term and even you know, 20 years out, and think about health innovators and the the challenges that they're solving, the things that they see right in front of them that they care um, to put their time and energy around. What are some of the great opportunities that you think um, health innovators should focus their energy and attention on? Well, you know, I I I would have to probably come back to the to the whole idea of the uh, early childhood development and. Uh, as much as possible to keep it on a on a uh, group basis, and uh, I think that uh, a lot can be done in that fashion. We're we're working very hard with uh, the Frontier Nursing Service. Mm-hmm. Well, it used to be Frontier Nursing Service, is now the Frontier Nursing University, which is producing many many educated. Uh, a, a nurse midwives, nurse pediatricians, you know, it's, uh, all these kinds of um, yeah, a lot of the primary people who care. are yeah mm-hmm. who are needed uh, f- for f- for families and the, and they of course have had years of experience in in Kentucky and uh, and they know the people well. So we're we're hoping that we can do a breakthrough into the care of uh, people who are. In rural areas, and uh, and make that a, a real, a real breakthrough too. I think there are many opportunities in rural care, and the more we are comfortable and capable with using video communications and mm-hmm. remote, mm-hmm. Uh, remote learning, remote yeah, care, yeah. virtual care, we're seeing a great opportunity to. Uh, improve and level the standards of of care between our inner city, our suburban, and our rural areas. Mm-hmm. It's it's mm-hmm. wonderful to see that we can use a technology that really democratizes um, mm-hmm. the the mm-hmm. outcomes and the access. I think you're right, Sean. Yeah. I really do. Yeah, we're seeing a lot in um, telepsychiatry. At some point, we'll remove the tele. It will just be psychiatry, and yeah. <laughs> we don't we don't think about telebanking anymore or teletravel agency. So it it is interesting to see how nurses are embracing a range of technologies to solve the the circumstances and address the needs of people wherever they are, whether it's you mm-hmm. know, where they live, work, pray, and play. And with your model and um, emphasis and focus on trusting people and trusting communities and having them teach us how to care for them. I, I think we're in a really good place, Ruth. Well, I do too, and I, and I think that uh, there are many schools of nursing that are very open to uh, any way they can make uh, make the outcomes in this country better. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, and they're... they're um, the the whole idea of the professions working together to me seems to be taking hold, and I think it's something that we need, 
And, uh, for example, the, uh, the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine rewrote its its uh, requirements for setting up maternal and infant care uh, a few years ago, just few, maybe three years ago. And whereas it used to be level one, level two, level three, you know, level four hospitals, it converted to the the entry point being accredited freestanding birth centers. And that's another thing that the American Association of Birth Centers has done, which is to establish an accreditation program for the uh, for the birth centers. So it's uh, it's time that that things sort of came together. <laughs> and I feel that that your uh, your talking with me today makes me feel good. I hope so. I'm mm-hmm. I'm curious. Do you describe yourself as an innovator? Well, I'm described that way, I guess. You know, I was really uh, overwhelmed when I saw there's been an article in uh, in Nursing Outlook, mm-hmm. mm, maybe in 2017, about innovation, mm-hmm. especially into into social aspects. And uh, so I I was I began to read it. I knew some of the people who had. Uh, contributed to it. The RAND Corporation, I think, had started it, but uh, there were others in there, like Diana Mason, Mm -hmm. whom I have known for years and who's always been supportive of us, and uh, some of the the, uh, nursing staff at Penn, uh, Tony Mm -hmm. uh But anyway, it went into the, the fact that nurses have long had an interest in improving the social world, too. And it started out by talking about the first one being Florence Nightingale. And I thought, well, that's for sure. And then it talked about, uh, let's see, who the second one was. I think it was Lillian Wald. Oh, I know, Lillian Wald, Wald. who set up the the visiting nurse service. Mm -hmm. And then the third person it mentioned was somebody named Ruth Lubick. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I guess I better listen. (laughs) It's, it's a great compliment, I think. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just really delighted that uh, that it was said. I'm, I'm not sure I deserve that. But, but anyway, it, it makes me feel good and makes my husband feel good, too. I appreciate that. And I am so grateful for this conversation. Thank you, Sean. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bill. Ruth most certainly is deserving of the innovator status and the title of living legend that was granted to her in 2001 by the American Academy of Nursing. Ruth Lubick is a nurse, midwife, and applied anthropologist whose work in the field of community-centered birthing has spanned over six decades. At 93, Ruth continues to advocate for marginalized and low-income families. She and her husband, Bill, joined us from the NPR studios in Washington, D.C., What struck me about our conversation was how timely Ruth's message and work remain. She mentioned having started a movement that even she couldn't stop if she wanted to. And that is so true. Initiatives like Common Sense Childbirth, Baby Live Advice, the Black Mamas Matter Alliance, and the National Birth Equity Collaborative are all innovating to change the shocking statistical tide of maternal mortality and morbidity in the U.S. The idea that it takes a village to raise a child, it can't be a throwaway line. Ruth reminds us that innovating for safety, for dignity, empowerment, joy, and community must be at the forefront when it comes to how we understand, imagine, and develop healthcare for women, mothers, and babies, and that nurses need to be in those conversations every step and every breath of the way. For See You Now, I'm Shauna Butler. Thank you for listening. Nurses are transforming healthcare through innovation, compassion, and leadership. And Johnson & Johnson is proud to continue its 125-year commitment to champion nurses through recognition, skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association is dedicated to building a culture of innovation. Nurses improve the lives of patients and communities through innovative thinking, empathetic connection, scientific rigor, and sheer determination. 
ANA is proud to support and advocate for our nation's most valuable health care resource, our nurses. For more information on CU Now and to listen to any of the earlier episodes in our library, visit cunowpodcast.com.